Hi, I am Allie Deering Anderson. The longest video that you will watch may be this one. There is a requirement in the Nebraska regulations that we review the actions, the drug interactions, and the effects of the non-contraceptive drugs and devices on the approved formulary. In order to be sure that this makes sense, we're going to discuss not only the actions, drug interactions, and effects of those drugs, but we are going to discuss what formulary we're talking about. If you are a prescriber in Nebraska, there is no requirement for you to watch this video. The regulators and the legislature determined if you could write a prescription for the drugs, you would best know all of this information already. You are certainly welcome to watch with us, but there is no mandate. For nurses, this will be regulatory section 2A2F. Public health clinic workers, there is no requirement for you to watch this video. You see, the law will only allow you to dispense refills of oral contraceptives. Because we're talking about everything on the formulary except oral contraceptives, for public health clinic workers, you may watch if you'd like. It's great information, and certainly you will hear your patients discussing it, but you may never counsel on these drugs, and you may never dispense these drugs. I am Allie Deering Anderson. I am a pharmacist at the University of Nebraska College of Pharmacy. This video was written in the summer of 2011. It is important that you know that the drugs that we are talking about are still on the current pharmacy formulary. You will want to check the statutes, the regulations, and contact your consultant pharmacist. Remember, the formulary can and will change. When we're talking about drugs and you are looking at a slide, the proper presentation for those drugs is that brand names start with a capital letter. Generic names start with a lower case letter. So if you see something like the third line here, Flagyl, the brand name starts with a capital F. Metronidazole, the generic name, starts with a lower case M. In July of 2011, the Formulary Advisory Committee to the Nebraska Board of Examiners in Pharmacy met and recommended a formulary which includes all oral contraceptives, the NuvaRing, the OrthoEvra patch, and all of the drugs listed in the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Sexually Transmitted Diseases Guidelines published in February of 2010. There will be an update to the STI guidelines in February of 2012. After those guidelines have been published and reviewed, we will redo this videotape. Until that time, this is as good as we can do. Also in July of 2011, the Board of Pharmacy approved this formulary. The formulary approved by the Nebraska Board of Pharmacy in July of 2011 is printed in your pharmacy manual. If you want to see a copy of it, I refer you to your manual. One of the ways to keep track of the formulary is to wait for notice from the Board of Pharmacy that things have changed. Julie Reno and the other folks in Nebraska Reproductive Health will do their jobs to make sure that you know when a change has occurred. Approve the drugs that have been recommended by the CDC for STI guidelines is a tough, tough challenge for anyone. You see, the Center for Disease Control approves drugs as required for the entire country. There will be drugs approved on the formulary that we may never need in Nebraska. There may not be sufficient drug resistance for us to use those drugs, but they may be approved. Please understand the guidelines change. They change every two years, that's the even numbered years, in February. Drug resistance is an amazing problem when we talk about antibiotics. Most of our video today will be about antibiotics. Please use the internet when you are looking for the current CDC guidelines. Do not rely on printed information. That's why the guidelines are not 
in your pharmacy manual. The current, pharma the current formulary is printed there, but the guidelines are not because they outdate. And it would be tragic if we used old guidelines to take care of our patients. The website for the CDC STI guidelines is easy. It's cdc.gov slash STD. If you can't remember that, just go to cdc.gov and then type sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections and you can find it. Honestly, using the CDC website is as easy as cdc.gov. We're going to review the drugs by the sexually transmitted infection. I understand that sometimes I use language that you don't use. STD stands for sexually transmitted disease. STI, sexually transmitted infection. Most of the time, they're the same thing. I just prefer STI because I think when we say infections, we remember every time we say that, that we are talking about diseases that are contagious. When we look at the CDC prevention guidelines, they tell us that there's a whole lot more to prevention than drugs. There's education and counseling. There is the identification of asymptomatic people and symptomatic people who are not likely to seek diagnostic treatment and services. Part of prevention is effective diagnosis and treatment and the counseling of infected people to keep them from infecting anyone else. There is the evaluation, treatment, and counseling of the partners of those who are infected. Not every infection is 100% transmitted, but we still need to counsel partners to keep them disease-free. There are also a few pre-exposure vaccines for at-risk people. That's the only place that drugs really play a role in prevention. Maybe in treating infected people, but that's a tough sell for me to call that prevention. Why aren't there any vaccines on your formulary? Because we never dispense them. Remember, the formulary is those drugs that you dispense. We have some important definitions other than just dispensing. An antibiotic kills something that's alive. An antibiotic we tend to think of as a drug. An antibiotic could be a mouse trap. An antibiotic could be a fly swatter. But most of the time when we're talking about antibiotics, we're talking about drugs that kill something that's alive. We also have antivirals. They inactivate viruses. You can't kill them because viruses are not alive. Viruses cannot reproduce by themselves. Bactericidal means it kills bacteria. Bacteriostatic means it prevents bacteria from reproducing, but it doesn't kill the ones that are there right now. So patients who have any problem with their immune system do not always benefit from a bacteriostatic antibiotic because it doesn't kill the bacteria fast enough. When we look at the mechanism of action and drug actions, drug interactions and therapeutic issues, all of those things, remember that it stays the same regardless of the diagnosis for use. So, when we talk about a drug, it only gets its one moment in the sun. The drug may be used for lots and lots of sexually transmitted diseases. But to spend your time talking about the action and the interaction and the therapeutic issues every time would make you bored. And it would make this tape very long. And I want you to listen to it. And I want you to enjoy as much as you can enjoy pharmacology and therapeutics what we have to say. When we look at the diseases listed in the STI guidelines from the CDC, the first one we see is chancroid. The drugs of choice for treating chancroid are azithromycin and ceftriaxone. 
ciprofloxacin, and erythromycin. When we look at azithromycin, the mechanism of action is that it is a macrolide antibiotic. It prevents protein synthesis at the 50S subunit of the bacteria. I know, some of you are rolling your eyes, others of you are looking at one another going, what's the deal with the 50S subunit? I don't have to draw the bacteria. Well, we're going to see other drugs that also work at the 50S subunit, and it doesn't make sense to pile them on top of each other. If I've already taken care of that site, I ought to pick a different drug if I need to add one, and we'll see that as the program goes along. Are there drug interactions with azithromycin? The most serious, especially for your clinic, is that azithromycin can decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. Therapeutic issues for azithromycin? The first one is a very positive therapeutic issue. It's easy to use. It's often dosed once a day, and food doesn't matter, which makes it very convenient for our patients. Ciprofloxacin, another drug recommended for chancroid, is a fluoroquinolone class antibiotic. It prevents DNA replication and cell division in the bacteria. There are 68 reported major drug interactions with ciprofloxacin. Most of the drug interactions have to do with drug metabolism at cytochrome P450, the 1A2 variant. You don't have to remember those. You do have to remember that if we are dispensing ciprofloxacin and the patient is taking anything else, we'll probably need to contact the consultant pharmacist to assure that there is not a major drug interaction. Are there therapeutic issues with ciprofloxacin? Unfortunately, yes. The quinolones have been known to cause tendon rupture, specifically the Achilles tendon, and specifically in those folks who are not well-trained athletes but are attempting to do something athletic. However, when you read the studies, attempting to do something athletic may mean balancing yourself as you're slipping on the ice. It may mean climbing stairs. It may mean moving furniture so that you can scrub the floor. So if we have patients who would have serious risk of tendon rupture, ciprofloxacin may not be the drug we would choose. We also must be sure that ciprofloxacin is not used in pregnancy. Erythromycin is also a macrolide class antibiotic, just like azithromycin is. It also works at the 50S subunit, so we would never use azithromycin and erythromycin at the same time. Erythromycin is usually bactericidal. It has some drug interactions. It causes QT prolongation, which is an irregular heartbeat. So we have to be very careful in patients taking antiarrhythmics. It may also interact with other drugs to cause arrhythmias. Classically, the drug we think of is the old antihistamine called Seldane. It has been removed from the market in part because of this drug interaction. Erythromycin should not be used with clindamycin, that's even true if we're treating acne. And erythromycin may not be compatible with all statins, lovastatin and simvastatin and drugs that we use to treat cholesterol. Therapeutic issues for erythromycin is it takes multiple daily doses. You can't do erythromycin just once a day. Very rarely can you do erythromycin twice a day. In fact, it's not uncommon to see a prescription for erythromycin four times a day. When we ask a patient to take an antibiotic four times a day, it's very difficult for them to do that. It's also important to know that erythromycin, just like a mini baseball helmet full of goo, is a gut bomb. It really causes serious stomach upset for a number of patients. And because of that, 
And because of the multiple daily dosing, patients don't always take the drug like we have instructed them to do. When we look at herpes simplex, specifically herpes simplex type 2, there are three drugs recommended for treatment and for disease suppression. They are acyclovir, famacyclovir, and valcyclovir. All of the antivirals for herpes simplex prevent the building of viral DNA strands. The only way for the virus to reproduce itself is to make multiple copies of its own DNA strands and send them out to infect other cells. The antivirals that we use for herpes simplex and herpes zoster, that's shingles, prevents the building of viral DNA strands. The only major drug interaction amongst these antivirals is an interaction between acyclovir, which is Zovirax, and tizanidine, which is Xanaflex, a muscle relaxant. So our chances of running into this drug interaction are small, but it is important that we remember that one. Therapeutic issues, unlike most drugs, these work best if taken with a high fat meal. They actually work better if taken with a full fat milkshake, with a cheeseburger, with some french fries. All of the antivirals for herpes simplex can cause photosensitivity. That means they increase your risk of sunburn. And the dosage forms are very large. Many times the patients will complain or call them <sighs> horse pills. The reality is you can swallow them. They are appropriately shaped. They are appropriately coated, but they're pretty big compared to some of the other dosage forms that we give to our patients. Granuloma inguinale, which is caused by Klebsiella, can be treated with doxycycline, azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, erythromycin, or the combination sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Remember we said each drug only gets its one moment in the sun? We've already talked about azithromycin, we've already talked about ciprofloxacin, and we've already talked about erythromycin. The way they work is exactly the same. The drug interactions, exactly the same. The therapeutic issues, the side effects, all exactly the same. You see, the drug doesn't change just because the disease has changed. changed. So if you have questions about those, you're going to have to go back in the video for a little bit. Doxycycline is a tetracycline class antibiotic. It inhibits the 30S subunit of RNA synthesis. So while azithromycin and erythromycin inhibit the 50S subunit, doxycycline inhibits the 30S subunit. In theory, we could, if we had to, use them together. Drug interactions for doxycycline are fairly minimal. However, it should not be taken with large doses of calcium or magnesium, that is, at the same time. Therapeutic issues for doxycycline, it can cause some serious photosensitivity and sunburning. Please check the expiration date. All tetracyclines, when they have expired, become poison. They don't get weaker, they get dangerous and they can cause a kidney problem called Fanconi syndrome. It is essential that every time you dispense a tetracycline class antibiotic, that you assure that it is in date and that it will be in date when the patient completes therapy. Tetracyclines, doxycycline included, can also stain teeth and bones as they are growing. None of these antibiotics are given to children under the age of 12, and we should be careful using them in pregnancy because of the tooth staining and the bone staining. Sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim, which is also called Bactrim, is also appropriate for this disease. The mechanism of action is a little bit complicated. 
For the sulfas, they inhibit a piece of the folic acid pathways. Trimethoprim, a folate inhibitor, inhibits a second piece of the folic acid pathway. And so what we have is bacteriostatic sulfa, bacteriostatic trimethoprim. But because they work in synchronicity, they become together bacteriocidal. Complicated concept, even for my pharmacy students. But what we need to remember is that sulfamethoxazole plus trimethoprim will kill the bacteria. That's our goal. Drug interactions, fascinatingly, sulfamethoxazole plus trimethoprim do not interfere with hormonal contraceptives. And that's a good thing if our clients are taking contraceptives that contain female hormones and they also have an infection which is appropriately treated with sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Therapeutic issues can be big. The risk of sunburn from sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim is huge. You can get sunburned driving your car from the sunlight that comes through the windshield and the side window. People using sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim should wear sunscreen anytime they may be exposed to the sun, even scooping snow in February. Please understand also that patients may be allergic to sulfa, which is the chemical that you're looking at, but they are very rarely, if ever, allergic to sulfur, which is a naturally occurring yellow rock. Patients who have a sulfa allergy probably cannot take sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim. If that's true, document the sulfa allergy. Don't ever say that a patient is allergic to sulfur. Lymphogranuloma venereum is caused by trachomatis. It can be treated with doxycycline or erythromycin, both of which are drugs that you have already learned about. Syphilis, which is caused by treponema pallidum, is frequently treated with drugs that are not dispensed. It is treated with benzathine penicillin 2.4 million units. Benzathine penicillin is never dispensed. Think about it. This is a painful and deep IM injection. We are not going to hand a patient a cold syringe of benzathine penicillin and say, go home and inject this. That's why it's not on your formulary. It's important that we talk about it because I think when you look at your formulary, your instinct is to say, but there are important drugs that are not here. There are important drugs for patient care that are not there but not important drugs that you dispense. Dispensed means the patient is supposed to take it home and use it without help. Administered are those drugs or devices that are given to the patient or injected into the patient at the clinic. You may actually hand the patient something in the clinic that they swallow right there in the clinic, but that's still administration. The only drugs and devices which will appear on your formulary are those which are dispensed, labeled, and sent home with the patient for the patient's use alone at home. If we have a patient with a life-threatening penicillin allergy, that is, when we give them penicillin, they have difficulty breathing, they have anaphylactic reactions, we might be able to treat syphilis with doxycycline or tetracycline. Probably not something that you are going to do in your clinic. A referral to infectious disease specialty is absolutely best in a patient who is positive for syphilis with a life-threatening penicillin allergy. Please help us help patients understand allergy. 
Just as we get frustrated with people who have a sulfa allergy telling us allergic that they're, uh, that they're allergic to yellow rocks. We also get frustrated when patients list side effects as allergies. When patients say, because my mother had a problem, I believe that I am allergic. Allergy means you got a rash. You got hives, you, you, you got serious itching with visible lesions. Your face swelled, your tongue swelled, or you had difficulty breathing. That's it. That's the end of the discussion for drug allergies. Diarrhea from Augmentin is a side effect, not an allergy. Nausea from codeine is a side effect, not an allergy. And sometimes bad things happen when you are taking drugs that have nothing to do with the drugs. If you have any question, contact your consultant pharmacist about anything that a patient claims is an allergy. It may cost us lots more money and it may damage the patient's ability to be disease free if we avoid using drugs that they're not really allergic to anyway. Tetracycline, in theory, might be used in serious penicillin allergies with a positive syphilis. The mechanism of action is tetracycline belongs to the tetracycline class, just like doxycycline. It inhibits the 30S subunit of the bacterial replication process, so we would never use tetracycline with doxycycline at the same time. Tetracycline interacts with all heavy metals. It interacts with iron. It interacts with calcium. It interacts with magnesium, even at very low levels. Therefore, tetracycline must be taken with plain water on an empty stomach. Tetracycline is also taken four times a day. You can't see all of me in this video, but you can see enough of me to know that it would be hard to find four times in my day when my stomach was empty. That's true for lots of our patients, which makes using tetracycline as an antibiotic to treat sexually transmitted diseases very, very difficult. It is certainly less convenient than doxycycline, where you only have to avoid dairy, calcium, and magnesium, not all food. Non-gonococcal urethritis is most often caused by chlamydia. When it is caused by chlamydia, we treat with azithromycin or doxycycline. We may also treat with erythromycin, levofloxacin, and ofloxacin. When the non-gonococcal urethritis is caused by M. genitalium, azithromycin is preferred. The quinolones, we've talked about ciprofloxacin, but that family also includes levofloxacin and ofloxacin, which are now being listed as a treatment for the STD that we're discussing. The mechanism of action is to prevent DNA replication. All of the quinolones have drug interactions with warfarin, an anticoagulant, cyclosporin, a drug that we use to prevent organ rejection, antiarrhythmics, and oral contraceptives. All three have the same warnings about sunburn, about call the pharmacist if they're taking anything else when they get this prescription, about tendon rupture, and about inability to use during pregnancy. Persistent urethritis, whether it's caused by you, your relictum, by M. genitalium, or by T. vaginalis, if it is persistent urethritis, we need to treat more aggressively. We may treat with metronidazole, we may treat with tenidazole and azithromycin. Metronidazole, the, the mechanism of action, is that it forms unstable DNA in the bacteria that we are trying to treat. So it can't reproduce itself and it actually is killed. Metronidazole also produces a bacterial toxin when it is absorbed. 
So in addition to preventing all replication of the bacteria, it is toxic directly to the bacteria. Metronidazole has drug interactions with warfarin. It will dramatically increase your chance of bleeding. And metronidazole has a huge drug interaction with alcohol. The interaction actually occurs at your liver. But when one takes metronidazole with alcohol, you get serious GI disturbance. You can have crushing chest pain. You can actually believe that you are having a heart attack. And for some patients, the results can be damage to the GI system and rarely cardiac damage. Also, metronidazole is another gut bomb. It certainly can cause upset stomach even without alcohol. Tinidazole, we could go through the mechanism of action and the drug interactions and the therapeutic in issues, but let's make this one really easy. Think metronidazole and you have it. It causes a bacterial toxin, it destabilizes DNA. It has the same drug interactions with warfarin and with alcohol. It has the same therapeutic issues. Never, ever use tinidazole at the same time as metronidazole. They function very, very much the same, and it would not be appropriate to use them together. Cervicitis can be caused by C. trachomotis. It can be caused by gonorrhea, and, can it, and it can be caused by M. genitalium. The presumptive treatment for cervicitis is azithromycin or doxycycline, and we've learned about those, both of those. Chlamydia is treated with azithromycin or doxycycline. Erythromycin, levofloxacin, or ofloxacin. Stunningly, you will see that ciprofloxacin is no longer recommended for the treatment of chlamydia because we have so much ciprofloxacin resistance in chlamydia. I think that's scary. I think that at some point we may actually run out of drugs to treat chlamydia because it is developing drug resistant. It is essential that your patients understand they must appropriately take all of the antibiotics in the regimen that you are giving them in order to prevent drug resistance. Gonorrhea is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea. We frequently treat it with ceftriaxone and cefixime. These are injected cephalosporins. We may inject a cephalosporin and give azithromycin. We may inject a cephalosporin and give doxycycline. Gonorrhea is also becoming increasingly drug resistant and we need to become increasingly creative in order to treat it. Cefixime is a third generation cephalosporin. It, it disrupts the formation of bacterial cell walls. So in essence, the cells become leaky. The good stuff leaks out and the bad stuff leaks in and the bacterial cell dies. Cefixime and other third generation cephalosporins do interact with oral contraceptives and decrease their efficacy. They do interact with high dose warfarin. A patient who needs a big dose of drug to be anticoagulated will have an increased risk of bleeding when we use third generation cephalosporins. The improper dosing of cephalosporins is actually very common. We assume that because we can use high dose amoxicillin twice a day, that we can use high dose cephalosporins twice a day, and that's not true. Many of the cephalosporins must be dosed four times a day to maintain drug levels high enough to kill bacteria. One of our problems when we talk about using cephalosporins is that there is a minor but important cross-reaction between cephalosporins and penicillin allergies. The cross-reaction is less than 10%. That is, patients who say to you, I am allergic to penicillin, less than 10% of the time will also be allergic to cephalosporins. 
If a patient is truly penicillin allergic, they have difficulty breathing, they've had anaphylaxis, we do our best to avoid cephalosporins. Even 10% is too big a risk. But the three cephalosporins most common in cross-reactivity are cephachlor, which is seclor, cephridine, which is veloceph, and cephalexin, which is keflex. And I'll tell you truthfully, most people don't use Velocef anymore. It stinks, it tastes awful, and it makes your sweat smell, just like penicillin does. So it was never a particularly popular cephalosporin in the first place. When we look at injectable cephalosporins, we have to remember they're not going to show up on your formulary you're never going to send them home with somebody. You are simply going to inject them in the clinic. When we look at bacterial vaginosis, bacterial vaginosis can be caused by lots of different anaerobic bacteria. Metronidazole used vaginally or orally. Clindamycin used vaginally or orally and tinidazole used orally can all be appropriate for treating anaerobic bacteria causing bacterial vaginosis. Clindamycin is a lincosamide class antibiotic. It inhibits the 50S subunit. So it would be very rare for us to use clindamycin and azithromycin because they would be attacking the same part of the bacteria. Clindamycin is likely only bacteriostatic. It won't kill existing bacteria. They will ultimately die on their own. It will simply prevent replication of those bacteria. There are few drug interactions with clindamycin that are hugely significant, but we will avoid like-acting antibiotics. Therapeutic issues for clindamycin is the potential for clindamycin to induce or cause overgrowth of Clostridium difficile, resulting in a condition that we call pseudomembranous colitis. That can be very dangerous for patients, and we do need to warn them that if they have major changes in bowel habits and severe gastric upset, that we would like to see them again. Trichomoniasis is caused by trich vaginalis. The drug of choice for trich vaginalis is metronidazole or tinidazole, and we have discussed both of those. We certainly have vaginal yeast. Remember the law will allow you to treat vaginal infections. Probably the most common vaginal infection is yeast caused by candida albicans. It can be treated with many OTC anti-yeast products. Butaconazole, clotrimazole, myconazole, teoconazole. It can also be treated with prescription class anti yeast products, butaconazole, which is actually available as bioadhesive in the prescription version. It can be treated with nystatin orally, can be treated with terconazole, it can be treated with fluconazole. When we look at the clotrimazole and the Conazoles, that would be butaconazole, myconazole, tioconazole, and terconazole, and nystatin. They all function relatively similarly. They interrupt the fungal cell wall. And just like the drugs that we looked at that interrupted the bacterial cell wall, when we interrupt the cell wall of a fungus, it leaks. The bad stuff comes in, the good stuff goes out. The more important piece, though, is that funguses need to stack on each other sort of like Legos in order to grow and stay healthy. When I interrupt the cell wall of part of that colony, the whole thing may crumble. So we end up with really good results. I do have a special note about fluconazole. Many insurance companies will not pay for the dosing of fluconazole that your prescribers want to use. Frequently, we recommend that a patient take fluconazole by mouth. This is Diflucan today, and then take it again in three days, and then take it again in seven days, and then take it once a week for a couple of weeks, and, and insurance companies don't like paying for that. 
So please be sure that your patient actually has access to the drug if you cannot dispense it for yourself. And be careful when you are billing it because you may not get paid. Vaginal products that are antifungal, that is, those antifungals that we use vaginally may compromise diaphragms and condoms. The reality is, is you should not be having sex with somebody who has a yeast infection. The big deal with yeast infections is that tissue, vaginal tissue, becomes very fragile and friable. It can rip, it can tear, it can bleed. Having sex with somebody who has a yeast infection means that you may be putting them at risk of a secondary bacterial infection. And that is an important part of patient counseling when we talk about using antifungals for vaginal treatment. Please also remember that vaginal odor is not diagnostic. Dying fungi stink, just like growing fungi stink. And you will need to help the patient understand that vaginal odor is not a good way to determine whether or not the antifungals or the bacterial vaginosis drugs are actually working. When we talk about pelvic inflammatory disease, there are a variety of causative agents. And sometimes we have to give patients parenteral or IV therapy to treat serious pelvic inflammatory disease. We may use ceftriaxone plus doxycycline plus or minus metronidazole or flagyl, or we may use cefoxetin with doxycycline with or without metronidazole. Other injectable cephalosporins can be used too. Frequently, we will need to institutionalize the patient because we may not be able to get them to come back day after day after day after day for enough injections to treat pelvic inflammatory disease. Epididymitis is the actual inflammation of the epididymis. There are several causative agents, including enteric organisms like E. coli. Epididymitis is treated with ceftriaxone plus doxycycline or levofloxacin or ofloxacin. HPV, the human papillomavirus, is treated with pedophilox, amiquamod, or the cynocatechins, which may be new to you and we'll spend a little time with them. Pedophilox causes viral necrosis. It actually causes the virus and the cells infected by the virus to necrose and die. Drug interactions don't put anything else on the treatment warts. Don't try to mix pedophilox with, oh heaven forbid, compound W. Don't try to mix pedophilox with a moisturizer. Don't try to mix pedophilox with something to get rid of redness or itching. Those would be significant drug interactions that would interfere with the ability of pedophilox to work. Therapeutic issues, it should be used only for warts on skin. That means we cannot use it for internal vaginal or internal rectal or internal urethral warts. It may be important to protect surrounding areas with petroleum jelly. Because pedophilox causes cell necrosis, often, depending on the placement of the wart, we tell the patient to make our circle, a donut if you will, around the wart with Vaseline and then apply the pedophilox to protect underlying and otherwise healthy skin. Amiquamod actually stimulates our immune system to attack the wart. We don't completely understand how that works. Maybe if we did, we could come up with other drugs. Again, do not combine imiquimod with other therapies. It cannot be inserted. It cannot be used for interrectal warts, intervaginal warts, or interurethral warts. Imiquimod can only be used for warts on the surface. The cynocatechins are actually extracts of green tea. How does it work? Nobody knows. 
We know that it is used three times a day until the warts have cleared or until you've used the product for 16 weeks. The cyanocatechins have been recognized by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as possibly useful. It has no reported drug interactions. Never, never occlude the treatment. That means don't put a Band-Aid over it. Don't put Saran Wrap over it. Don't use Vaseline or other jelly products with it. Never occlude the treatment. Therapeutic issues, it is actually an extract of green tea. It may stain skin. It may stain clothing. It may stain bedding. Never, ever insert the ointment. If we are treating interrectal, intravaginal, or intraurethral warts, the patients are not going to be doing that at home, and we don't have to worry about dispensing anything. The cyanocatechins, like the others, imiquimod and pedophilox, are for surface lesions only. Pediculus pubis is actually a sexually transmitted disease. We can treat pubic lice, or crabs, with permethrin, pyrethrins plus piperineal butoxide, malathion, or very, very rarely, oral ivermectin. Permethrin is neurotoxic. It will actually kill the crab louse. It has no significant drug interactions, but there are some significant therapeutic issues. It is relatively safe for mammals, except cats. And as strange as it sounds to you, sometimes when people have been diagnosed with crab lice, they attempt to treat every living thing in their world. They treat dogs, they treat cats, they treat gerbils, they treat partners, they treat whatever. And the reality is we should only use permethrin to treat humans who have been diagnosed with crab lice. And the side effects, the tingling, the burning, may be significantly increased if the patient has any open skin, which is also possible if the crab lice have caused itching and you're scratching at it. There is a combination product with pyrethrins and piperineal butoxide. Pyrethrin is neurotoxic. The piperineal butoxide stops the pyrethrin from being broken down. Pyrethrins are extracts of the chrysanthemum flowers. They have no known drug interactions, but a therapeutic issue that we really need to focus on is that patients who are allergic to mums, chrysanthemums, marigolds, are very likely allergic to the pyrethrins, and we must carefully screen for that to make a good therapeutic determination. Malathion can be used to treat crab lice and other lice. Its mechanism of action is it's an organophosphate insecticide. It has no known drug interactions, but it can have significant, significant absorption through the skin of the young and the elderly, and it is not recommended for any of them. Or absorbing an organophosphate insecticide can cause neurologic damage. The prescription strength is one half of 1%. Please do not let your patients think that they can go to the garden store and purchase malathion because it has the same name. It's the same chemical, not the same strength and not appropriate for use on the human body. Ivermectin is an oral drug. It inhibits nervous system function. It's used in ant traps sometimes. It has no significant drug interactions, but I have to tell you, I have never seen ivermectin used for crabs or for scabies. It's most often used for roundworm infections, for things like river blindness. It is given as a single dose. For those of you who are interested in the process of river blindness and other roundworm infections, People swimming in infected rivers are contaminated with the infectious roundworms. The roundworms can work their ways to the eyes, cause liver blindness. They can work the way, their way up other blood vessels and cause significant GI problems. That's what ivermectin was originally for. It's really not appropriate for the use and treatment of scabies or crab lice. 
Drugs used to treat scabies include permethrin cream, ivermectin, and occasionally we use lindane. Please understand that scabies, while contagious, is not ever treated prophylactically. All of the drugs we use kill scabies. All of the drugs we use have some potential to be neurotoxic. Do not slather yourself with anti-scabies drugs unless you have scabies. The drug won't last long enough to kill one if it were to happen to make the trip onto your body, and you would dramatically increase your risk of neurotoxicity. Lindane, also a neurotoxin. Lindane has been banned in agriculture in over 50 countries. There are no drug interactions when it is used to treat scabies. It does, however, have a therapeutic black box warning, the most severe warning that our government can give a drug without banning it from the market or requiring prescribers and dispensers to sign up with a registry for permission to dispense. The black box, war black, black box warning for Lindane is it cannot be used in children, it cannot be used on infants, it cannot be used in the elderly, it cannot be used in people with open skin, it cannot be used in people with seizure disorder, and anyone who weighs less than 50 kilograms, even if they're not young or very old, even if they don't have open skin, even if they don't have a seizure disorder, 50 kilograms is the minimum weight for people where we can use Lindane. The information that you have been presented today on drug actions, interactions, and effects came from the CDC Sexually Transmitted Disease Guidelines published in 2010. The chairman of the review committee at that time was Kimberly Workowski. All CDC Sexually Transmitted Disease Guidelines are published originally in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. They can also be found online at cdc.gov. Please remember that the Board of Pharmacy in July of 2011 automatically approved all drugs listed for dispensing in the CDC guidelines. So regardless of when you watch this tape, if the new guidelines have been published, and they will in February of 2012, those drugs will automatically be approved for your formulary if there are drugs which do not occur on your current formulary. We have already had a video on the effects, drug interactions, and doses of oral contraceptives. But remember, there are contraceptives in public health clinics which cannot be dispensed. And we need to look at a couple of those issues. We're going to call them the leftover hormonal contraceptives. That is the ones you don't swallow. We have the contraceptive patch, orthoevra, and we have the vaginal contraceptive ring, nuva ring. All of the same concepts apply that apply with oral hormonal contraceptives. All of those concepts, including increased risk to smokers, there may be a drug interaction with certain antibiotics, all of those things apply, but those drugs cannot be refilled at public health clinics. The law won't allow that. Also in our world of sort of leftover products, we have cervical diaphragms. One of the devices that you would actually dispense to a patient to take home. They work by creating a barrier. They can be severely damaged by petroleum-based products. We all think of things like Vaseline, but you also have to remember that some of our vaginal antibiotics and a number of our vaginal antifungals are actually petroleum-based products and would compromise a diaphragm. Diaphragms do get old and they need to be replaced. We need to have a fit check if the patient has gained or lost 15 pounds. And unfortunately, the spermicide, Nonoxyl 9, 
which is frequently used with cervical diaphragms, probably increases the risk of bacterial urinary tract infections. So for those patients who get routine postcoital bacterial UTIs, those patients that have headboard antibiotics, as it were, maybe using nonoxyl 9 with cervical diaphragms is not the best choice for contraception. The law determines what might be on the formulary that we are discussing. Drugs and devices for contraception. Drugs and devices for sexually transmitted diseases. And drugs and devices for vaginal infections. Those are the only drugs on the formulary which may be dispensed, that is, sent home from your clinic with the patient for use by the patient. Formulary lists what you can dispense. Over-the-counter products are sold without dispensing. They don't have labels. They don't have the same record keeping. The over-the-counter vaginal yeast products. Over-the-counter nonoxyl 9. Over-the-counter condoms. Do not appear on your formulary because they are not dispensed. They are simply sold to the patient. Injectable antibiotics, intrauterine devices, vaccines are administered. They are not dispensed and they will not appear on your formulary. If any of this is confusing, if something just plain doesn't make sense, talk with your consultant pharmacist and they will help you understand what products are on the formulary and what products you actually use that are not on the formulary. And also remember, just because the Board of Pharmacy has said you may stock something doesn't mean you have to. There are drugs approved by CDC that you will never use. If no one in your clinic is going to prescribe them, there is no reason for you to stock them. If you always use metronidazole and you never use tenidazole, there's no reason to stock that. Just because you may stock something, because it is on the formulary, doesn't mean you have to. The formulary is not a mandate. This completes the section of your training concerning non-oral contraceptive drugs effects, side effects, and drug interactions. Please mark this section as completed on the training form in your manual. Thanks for hanging with me. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, your consultant pharmacist, or the folks in reproductive health at the Nebraska Department of Health. They would be happy to help you understand. And stay tuned for February of 2012 when the CDC guidelines for the treatment of many of these diseases may change.